السلام عليكم
وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا رسول الله اللهم يا رحمن يا رحيم يا علي يا عظيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى النبي الأمين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحان الله سبحان الله وحده لا شريك له نؤمن به ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستجيره ونستنصره فإنه حق من هدى الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونبتهل إليك يا الله وندعوك وندعوك قائلين اللهم اصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا واصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا آخرتنا التي فيها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر لا إله إلا أنت الله سبحانه وتعالى in so many occasions in the Quran Allah puts us on notice of something that we already know innately and intuitively if we are people with any level of reflection and deliberation, and the thing that we are put in notice on, on notice to, or what Allah alerts us to, is the sheer capacity for ifsad, for corruption, for spoilation, for exploitation, all falling under the rubric of ifsad, that human beings do indeed possess. And indeed in Surah Al-Rum, Allah tells us 
ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس corruption spreads everywhere and the source of this corruption are human beings themselves the exercise of their volition and their willpower and that Allah tells us in Surah Al-Rum that when it comes to suffering the consequences and the results of this corruption, Allah mitigates the relationship between the action and the result. لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُ that Allah only allows us to suffer part of what we earn, not all of it, not even most of it, but simply a part of what we earn. And we know that in Surah Fatir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the very end of the surah and indeed closing the surah reminds us that if Allah would allow us to suffer the consequences of our own actions nothing would survive Nothing would survive our own evil. And so, in God's grace, in God's mercy, God has intervened in the past, continues to intervene, and will intervene to mitigate the consequences of our own follies, to continue giving humanity a chance after a chance after a chance after a chance Pause and think just from the last Juma to this Juma, just from the last Juma to this Juma, hundreds of families, hundreds of families and perhaps even thousands of families in lands just like the lands we live in. It is part of the human folly to always imagine the alienness and foreignness of what plagues others. It is an entirely irrational belief and an irrational reaction. Psychologically, it is among the most irrational things we do is that we imagine that those who suffer a disaster are different from us. That somehow, it's entirely irrational, that somehow they speak differently, or they feel differently, or they dream differently, or they think differently, or they learn differently. While rationally, rationally, we know that none of it is true and that they are identical to us. So from one Juma to another Juma, 
hundreds of families in two Muslim countries, in Morocco, and in Libya, their lives changed forever and an instant. In an instant, their lives altered. They might have had numerous family members and an instant they might find themselves now alone in the world. They might have been people of wealth and an instant they find that they own nothing. They might have never thought of hunger as a threat, but overnight they have no idea how to feed themselves or how to clothe themselves. They might have had careers and jobs, and overnight, these jobs and their, these careers has vanished forever. In one week, it is remarkable when you look now we live in the age of social media, and you see videos of people who were on camera when the disasters struck in Morocco and Libya. They are on camera chatting about whatever they're chatting, playing whatever game they're playing, indulging in whatever they are indulging. And in one instant, of course, in every video I've seen, there's this instant of disbelief. It cannot be. And then an instant of panic in which you hear, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, calling upon God and then the consequences, whatever transpires. The home is swept away to the ocean, the building collapses, whatever it is, but lives have altered forever. And like so many things in lives, the disasters that befall us are preceded with a long protracted, quite often, quite often tedious introduction. This is the remarkable thing and something that you see repeatedly through history of human beings. There is a small minority of people that keep warning about a particular danger. And a clear majority of people who tire of hearing about this danger, they get tired of it, they get sick of it. You keep warning us and warning us and warning us, okay, fine. Nothing happened, and we can't foresee anything happening, so just leave us alone. And then the disaster strikes. The thing that is striking like in Surah to Rum and Surah Fatir. In both Surah where Allah talks about human beings and the consequences of their fasad, in both Surah, right before or right after, 
the ayat that I cited, Allah calls upon us to reflect and study history. In this famous Quranic statement, Qul Siru, go ahead, inspect the Sunnah of humanity on this earth. Study the history of disasters. Study the sociology of disasters. Study the behavioral aspects of what precedes the disaster, what happens during the disaster, and what follows a disaster. You can't leave it all up to God. You can't just throw it onto God's shoulders and then blame God when you don't get the results you want because that's precisely what human beings do. We get tired of the warnings. We get tired of those who tell us take life seriously. We get tired of those who talk about the dangers posed and the risks that are undertaken. We get tired. And so what do we do? we effectively all throw it onto God's shoulders. We pay attention to our selfish little lives. And whether we admit it or not, whether consciously or subconsciously, whether we are rude about it in explicitly saying it, or polite about it in implicitly finding it, feeling it. We want to worry about our own lives. And we just expect that God will take care of it. And when the disaster happens, we don't remember the long history of warnings and what could have been done to avert the disaster. When the disaster strikes, our first reaction is, why God? Why did you allow us to suffer? You see, the damage in Morocco and the damage in Libya were both entirely avoidable. In other countries, in countries that predominantly belong to the white race and countries that predominantly belong to the Christian tradition. In these countries where they don't have defeated human beings preaching that apathy is part of God's will, and that accepting despotism and tyranny is just part of wisdom and the rule of law and cultures of honor and cultures of dignity. Earthquakes registering six point something happen. And in these countries, thousands of people are not killed. And thousands of people are not made homeless. And there isn't a total and complete collapse in providing people in dire circumstances with much needed emergency services. Right, that same storm that struck Libya and killed thousands of people, right before it came to Libya, it was in Greece. And in Greece, 
it left no casualties. In Libya, dams broke, and with the most sim simple Google research, you discover that Libyans, this minority, have been warning about these dams that they are woefully inadequate, that they are, were in imminent danger of collapsing for years. But the political system in Libya, like the political system in Morocco, like the political system in so much of the Muslim world, is a colonized political system, is a defeated political system, is an apathetic political system, is a political system that uses the jargon and rhetoric of God's will to offend against God's will. Use the jargon of surrendering to God to indeed rebel against what God wills. Because God warned us of the dangers of accepting facade fil ard, of accepting corruption, and tells us that I give you a chance after a chance after a chance after a chance. So when things collapse, now what? Are you now going to pay attention to what is disastrously wrong with your societies? Are you finally going to rebel against tyranny because tyranny is what keeps people in power who are not responsive to the needs of the people that they rule over? Tyranny is the devil's tool Tyranny is the devil's weapon because it is only tyranny and corruption and apathy that permits a people to stay in power although they put their fellow human beings in extreme dangers and risks and even after the calamity befalls people it is tyranny that still keeps them in power. So they can fail in their obligations and duties in protecting their Muslim brothers and sisters. And the earthquake or the flood can happen and can kill thousands of people. And it is tyranny that says there are no consequences. No one pays the price, and nothing changes, because that is exactly the situation that we face in both these countries. Nothing changed, and nothing will change. The very logic of tyranny is that There is facade, and human beings tacitly bless and affirm that facade by failing to change the conditions of facade. So thousands died, but the very people that ignored the warnings for years, the very people in power who could have averted the disaster, who did not avert the disaster, who failed in acting 
effectively and promptly after the disaster will be in power and will remain in power and then you're reminded of the fact that we live in a world in which these rulers who have an intimate relationship to Fasad Fil Ard, these rulers who are intimately involved with everything that corrupts are not willed in power by purely domestic forces, but are indeed often willed and bolstered in power by external forces that don't like Muslims very much. Read the history of the Moroccan ruling family. Read the history of Libyan politics and the extent to which countries, including Israel, France, and unfortunately the United States, went to keep certain elements in power in Libya. Read about the extent to which we seem to only care, and when I say we here, I mean America, to only care about one country in this entire region, and that's Israel. It seems that to the American consciousness, Israel constitutes the only human, truly human entity. We accept, however corrupt the Moroccan government might be, we accept that, as long as they're willing to sign a treaty with Israel. How corrupt the Sudanese government is, we accept that, as long as they're willing to sign a treaty with Israel. How horrible the Saudis are, we accept, as long as they're willing to sign a treaty with Israel. Even the fascist Egyptian government very recently, Congress tried to hold aid, withhold aid from Egypt. The Biden administration just overruled Congress, releasing some 1.3 or 1.6 billion dollars of aid to the fascist government of Egypt. We withheld something like 83 million dollars a drop in the bucket. Egypt, without a dis any dispute, has one of the worst human rights records in the world. One of the most mufsid governments on the face of this globe. The government of Egypt and its relationship to Fasad is unbelievable. Just the week that the American administration decided to release the money to the Egyptians' officers, the corrupt Egyptian officers, who take American tax dollar and put them in their pockets and line their pockets so they can enrich themselves at the expense of their people, just that week, 
Someone leaked horrific videos from the political prisons of Egypt. In this political, in these videos, you see the fate of honorable shiuch like Sheikh Mahmoud Shaban and Sheikh Hazim Abu, Abu Ismail. And you see the fate of other prominent figures, their suffering and their misery, their suffering and their misery in Egyptian prisons. And we, sitting in the United States, we don't care. We yap a lot about human rights, about human values, about democracy, about liberty. But our policies and our money always go to prop up dictators and mufsiduna fil ard, people who corrupt life on earth. Egypt has one of the worst human rights records on the face of this globe. And yet, we give the Egyptian government these Egyptian officers who are corrupt to the bone, thoroughly corrupt. They use the weapons we give them to oppress their own people. At the same time, that so many programs and so many causes complain of underfunding in the US. At the same time, that so many kids are saying, how are we going to afford college? How can we afford an education? We deny these people money and we give the money to dictators sitting in Egypt. Why? Why? And the answer always comes back to for the sake of Israel. Because Israel likes Sisi. Israel wants Egypt to be ruled by a tyrannical despot. Israel wants a corrupt government in Egypt. Why does Israel want that? Because Israel enjoys being the proclaimed single democracy in the Middle East. And as it builds its civilization, It enjoys being the single civilized force in a sea of barbarians. And so Israel exercised its good offices to persuade Biden's administration to release the money so that the money can go in the pockets of the corrupt Egyptian officers so they can more thoroughly oppress their people and more expansively commit fasad fil ard, corrupting the earth, and do so and ultimately be rewarded with plenty of dollars so that they can open overseas bank accounts, they can enlarge their holdings in the US and Europe, and the cycle keeps going on and on and on. The nature of disasters is before we see the full calamity, before our consciousness 
are shocked by the sheer level of misery. If we are honest with ourselves, we find a familiar story, a story of warnings, after warning, after warning. People like myself that stand up and say, don't give aid to dictators and criminals. People like myself who say, when the Egyptian people finally tire of being ruled with, by dictators and criminals, and they rebel against their dictators and the criminals that rule over them, and they blame the US because the US was the one that funded and supported, and then they commit acts that express their deep hostility to the prolonged American policies, you always find that there were voices warning for a very long time before a disaster falls. And in the same way that you find a long history of warnings, you also find a long history of ignoring these warnings. And so when Allah comes and says, people reflect. When corruption is committed on this earth and every bit of your senses is shocked by seeing what the floods in Libya have done or what an earthquake in Morocco has done, think about the style of life that you've condoned and supported and constructed and defended. Compare yourselves, compare the societies that suffer the disaster greatly and societies that are able to fend off potential disasters effectively. Come to your senses. It is easy to use God as your punching bag. But have you really thought? Have you really attempted to take responsibility? The irony is we have yet that same familiar story. A report came out that I think is extremely alarming. It tells us, scientists speak of something called planetary boundaries. There are nine indicia of planetary boundaries, boundaries that communicate the health of this planet, that this planet is able to rejuvenate, that this planet is able to fix the damage caused to itself. And out of these nine indicia or planetary boundaries, in this report, that came out recently, six of them, six of them warn us of the disaster that we are creating on this planet. So out of the nine, six have already been broken and the three remaining are in danger, high danger zones. The nutshell of it is that human society 
is pushing this planet towards destruction and extinction. We are killing off the planet. This is not the first, and I'm sure it's not going to be the last report. Again, warning after warning after warning. People, what you're doing is very dangerous. It will have dire consequences. Indeed, it will have disastrous consequences. At the same time that this report came out, Another report came out from the UN that talks about how the, our current moment, right now, as we speak, there are 47 million people in 50 different countries confronting famine conditions. The report goes on to say that there are 700 million people on this planet that go to bed every day hungry. Now, at the same time, you have this staggering, mind-boggling, mind-blowing number. 700 million people go to bed every day without enough to eat. Another item of news caught my attention that makes reflecting about what Allah says in Surah Al-Rum and Surah Fatir, truly a profound moment. One of the channels that I used to enjoy watching, Vice Channel, was known for its gritty, honest reporting from the trenches. For a long time, I felt that the nature of reporting from Vice Channel, the transparency, the honesty of that voice, the grittiness of their stories has changed. And I stopped watching Vice Channel a while ago. But then I noticed the story that says that Vice Channel initially posted a short documentary about the corrupt government in Saudi, but then promptly removed the video and made it inaccessible to the public. And the story goes on to talk about how Saudi money bought the bought up, literally purchased the integrity and freedom of the Vice Channel. In fact, Vice opened up a branch in Saudi and is hiring, and there is this really intimate, close relationship. Saudi Arabia gave Vice Channel millions of dollars, and Vice Channel completely changed its reporting. Now, we know that this is just a part of a phenomenon, that at the same time that technology had given us access to news, unprecedented access to news, more than any other time in history, more than any other time of history, the wealthiest of the wealthy in the world own, are buying up the venues 
for information and use. So the Elon Musks of the world and the Saudis of the world and the Emiratis of the world are buying up every platform that you can conceivably receive news from. And these platforms don't raise your consciousness about the millions of dollars we give to the fascists of Egypt. And don't raise your consciousness about our role, the role that the US played in the corrupt government in Libya, or the role that the US and France played in the government in Morocco. Don't raise your consciousness about why are 700 million people going to bed hungry every day? They don't raise your consciousness about the 50 countries that are confronting famine conditions. People are literally dying from starvation. They make sure that when you turn on your computer, that the news items that come up on your screen are sanitized and cleansed. It's like they have their own procedure of purification to make sure that your consciousness never elevates to the point of saying, why has facade spread? Why are we killing this planet? Why is the world order that persists and flourishes so demonic why are Muslims at the bottom of that world order? Why are Muslims constantly surviving under tyrannical governments everywhere you turn? Why is it that the best of the Muslim ummah, the scholars and thinkers are all rotting in prisons, tormented and oppressed? The why, the why, the why? Long time ago, Islam taught us. Islam taught us that there are three main analytical categories for the life of a human being. The ilm, the amal, and the hal. Ilm, your knowledge. Amal, your action. And hal is the state of your being. Ask yourself. It is easy to sit there and say, oh, what can I do? I'm so powerless. I'm so helpless. Before you accept this as an excuse for yourself, Ask yourself, what is your ilm? What sources does your ilm come from? What is your knowledge? What is your learning? Where does your learning come from? Who do you accept as teachers? Do you have teachers? Do you bother with teachers? What is your amal? Think of every day that you live. What do you do? Do you even spend any time becoming enlightened? Do you, Allah knows what is in your heart. And Allah knows whether if you had the opportunity to make a difference, you would indeed 
make, whether you would indeed make a difference or not, can you comfortably and honestly testify that if given the opportunity, you would actually make the difference? What is your hand? Are you apathetic? Are you oblivious? Are you alert? Are you learned? Are you conscientious? Do you actually make an effort? Your ilm, your knowledge, your amal, your action, and your hal, your consciousness. When Allah gazes down, and Allah knows everything perfectly, and Allah sees your ilm, your amal, your hal, do they testify that you deserve Allah's grace and Allah's mercy? Or do they testify the opposite? Do they say to God, God, we are with you, so lift us up. Or do they say, God, we abandoned you, so leave us where we are. Warnings, plenty of warnings. We are killing the earth. Warning after warning after warning. Warnings that now have lasted for centuries. Muslims continue to suffer tyranny and despotism and corruption with horrendous consequences. But who do you listen to? Who are your teachers? What are your sources? What do you invest in? How do you spend your time? Listen. How do you know? How do you know that if you exerted yourself, if you applied yourself, that if Allah peers into your heart and Allah sees what only Allah can see, that either Allah will put you in a position to finally render, perhaps, maybe, the constitutional judgment that changes our jurisprudence to say the executive branch is actually bound to obey the law because we have laws that say it is illegal to give money to despots and tyrants. But we don't have a court that forces the executive to abide by the law, to obey the law. How do you know that either God will look at you and say, I am finally going to put you in a position to actually make that difference? But here is the amazing thing. If Allah looks at you and knows that this is sincerely what is in your heart, that if you had the chance, you would act in such and such fashion, and Allah, for reasons that we don't know, doesn't give you the opportunity. But Allah knows that this is sincerely is what is in your, in your heart. Allah will give you the reward of the act if it would have been done. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that profound? If Allah knows that if given the opportunity, I would have fought off all temptations. I would have resisted all corruptions. In other words, I'm incorruptible. And indeed, if given the opportunity, I would have done the right thing to end people's suffering, to feed the hungry, 
to remove tyrants. Allah will say, I know that you're sincere and I will give you the reward as if you were given the opportunity and you passed the test. But the opposite is also true. If Allah knows that if Allah appeared in your heart, you would have not done what you were supposed to do. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله يستجيب لكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى النبي الأمين يا It is really, in so many levels, there is a simplicity and a straightforwardness to things. Fasad is a word that God used in the Quran. God used this word not because it is empty and of meaning and vacuous. God used the word because God knows it is a way of signaling to human beings a universe of meanings. And what can everyone, whoever has dealt with the, whoever dealt with the Arabic language knows is that the word facade connotes Corruption, destruction, what is vile, what is evil, what is reprehensible, what is immoral, what is demonic. Can you imagine those who, it is not just that they do not act to counter facade, but they're Muslim, or they say they're Muslim, but they no longer recognize facade. Pause for an instant and just reflect upon this. There are people who call themselves Muslims, who for them, if they see women wearing nail polish, they recognize that as facade. But if they see a tyrannical ruler who executes a hundred people so far just this year in Saudi, many of these kids people are minors after woefully inadequate judicial processes, that so-called Muslim doesn't recognize that as facade, but recognizes nail polish as facade. Wow. Can you imagine someone who calls himself a Muslim who hears a woman giving the adhan and he says, that's facade. But nothing steers in him when he reads or learns that there are 700 million people that are starving and that the world order that he never attacks or criticizes. And in fact, he designates that world order as some form of rule of law. To him, what do you say about this person's ilm, this person's amal, this person's hal?
I read a story several stories one story about how Palestinians confront water shortages all the time. Palestinian populations in Israel and occupied Palestine simply do not have enough water to drink, enough water to bathe, enough water to cook in. And while Israel monopolizes all the water sources including in occupied territory, to service its citizens, its people. Another story about how Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship are statistically in poorer health and empirically a third class citizenry that are denied the economic opportunities that are amply available to any Jew who arrives in Israel and becomes an Israeli citizen Immediately, just the economic opportunities that are available to them, not even imaginable for a Palestinian citizen. A clear, undeniable apartheid system without a shadow of doubt, an apartheid system. It uses anyone who is Arab and who's Muslim as a class chained, indentured, dependent to those of a different race and a different religion. An extremely painful story about how so many Palestinian children who need dire health care. Some of them have cancer or diseases or have been injured in war. In Gaza, at least two children a day who either the Israel allows them to leave Gaza to go to a hospital in Israel or perhaps in Egypt, if Egypt allows it, which is very unlikely, for treatment. And when they are denied, these children die. And the story talks about how at least two Palestinian children a day are denied and suffer the consequences of denial. And the world doesn't care. And the world doesn't care. And the media, from the most mainstream to vice channel, is bought up by the rich and corrupt and powerful. But I come to you and I say, before you sit there and say, well, what can I do? What is your ilm? What are you, what do you know? How have you educated yourself? What is your hal? If God knows what is in your heart, and God knows if you are preoccupied with your own pleasures, and your own passions, your own infatuations, obsessed with yourself because you think that you are God's gift to humanity, or you simply don't care, you're just selfish and you don't care to even think why. 
God looks, knows what is in this heart. Or do you actually care? And do you actually, God knows whether if given a chance, you will make the difference or you won't. And ultimately, what is your amal? What is your action? How do you translate this knowledge and this passion within? Do you even try, even at the smallest scale, in the most simple of ways, do you even bother to support, even with just what you click on, or when you have an opportunity to donate what you give money to, or if you have an opportunity to volunteer what you volunteer with, or if you have even just supporting a book that speaks the truth in our day and age is action. Even just knowing that a book came out that testifies to what is truthful and you say to yourself, I have to support the author, I'm going to buy the book just to support the author. That's amen. Do you even do that? Or are you oblivious? Do you have a real consciousness about what is facade? What is corruption on this earth? Are you one of those people who thinks of corruption in terms of nail polish and a woman's voice doing the azan? What occupies that gift that God gave you called the intellect. Allahumma khfir lana. Allahumma afu anna. Allahumma arhamna ya arham ar-rahimin. Allahumma tub alayna ya tawab. Wahdina li aqraba min hatha rashada. Allah forgive our sins. Allah help us to have the right ilm, knowledge, and amal, action, and hal, consciousness. Allah make us among those who recognize what is corruption and who resist it. And never make us among those who surrender to corruption and propagate it through their apathy and inaction. Allah always empower us to see what is right as right and what's wrong as wrong. And never make us among those who are either confused or confuse others. وصلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وإلى آله وأصحابه وأقم الصلاة